people in my view will be one of those sort of days, trust me. Now, today we're going to explore what it is that separates the different types of uh, gin and perhaps a little bit of precursor of what separates gin from a vodka. The literal only separation between a gin and a vodka is the presence of juniper. That's it. That's where gin gets its name from. Geneva, juniper. Um, there are books written out there. I've got a couple of them on my shelf. Some might separate the two. But at the moment in Australia, if I had four pepper, um, juniper berries to my vodka, I'm um, shaking it about, let it sit for a while. I've got a gin. Straight up and down. As far as I understand it, please tell me I'm wrong if I'm wrong in the comments. Now, the result is, is that there's a whole lot of people like Bilsons and that going out and making really interesting flavoured vodkas. Penny Avenue, that way, is making really interesting flavoured vodkas and they're using a lot of native botanicals and stuff like that. And Bilsons is just going out and, I don't know, taking a shit ton of drugs and coming up with some really weird and wacky coloured flavoured type of vodkas, but that's beside the point. Um, Penny Avenue on the peninsula is using Australian native botanicals in their vodkas and that makes it really, really hard to separate a gin, a gin from a vodka um, if we forget that all the gins that behind me have got juniper in them and that's the reason why they're gins and they're not vodkas. But even within the gin community there is three, well, I'm looking at six, six quick ones so we'll make this quick. Now we all drink plenty of dry gin, um, backwards high country gin is an example of a dry gin. Now this baby has to have all the botanicals are actually in a steep column, okay? Um, you, there's no added artificial flavorings like Bilson's, um, some of their vodkas, and that has just got a shit ton. Um, so they're very simple creatures. They've got coriander, they've got orris, they've got juniper, um, and that's about it to make your basic dry gin. The result is, is that you've got a very simple and very clear, um, very simple creature, but this means that your dry gin is just the perfect platform. You can go out and make it gin tea as I enjoy it. You can go out and you make your cosmopolitans, all the really good cocktails because dry gins are such basic spirits. They're so incredibly clean and simple and you can just build all sorts of things on top of them. Now, a London dry gin is a dry gin that happens to have been originally distilled in London itself. Um, and of course, when you've got a good little marketing thing and you're the capital of an empire, you slap a um, trademark on it. Um, and that's about as far as the separates. A London dry gin um, would possibly be, be a, and this would be more likely a bit more juniper, a bit more coriander. So moving right along. An old Tom gin is basically a gin that, how shall we say, was a bit, bit fucking rough. So it was that's from a time when basically the gin craze hit the UK, everyone who could put together a still was making it. Um, a lot of the uh, gin coming out was pretty rough, to say, you know, <laughs> but we were mildly, um, and the quality was rather down, but it was alcoholic, and people out there drinking it, and when they weren't going blind from methane, methanol poisoning, um, they found that this stuff, rather like my bathtub gin um, recently, uh, needed a fair bit of sweetening to actually make it drinkable. So they would add honey if they had the money or plenty of sugar or whatever um, to make she make it at least palatable. Now, a navy strength is what happens when you produce your, you, you know, your 95% dry gin. Dry gin needs to be cut because if you drink pure alcohol, 95%, you're gonna die. Um, it will literally burn and suck all the water out of your throat on the way down and then basically <laughs> it's off to the um, planting farm. So you've made your, made your nice dry gin and you've cut it down to, you know, to your 42, 40%, so you've cut it to, uh, one, to two point, one to two, two, one, one part to two and a half parts, you knocked it down to proof and you've got, oh, this is pretty damn fantastic. I think, you know, I, I'd like to make a navy, so what do you do? You grab some of that 95% stuff and you ease it back up to 57%. Now, back in the day when the Royal Navy was actually serving its um, cruise gin and there was gunpowder on these ships, the quickest way of finding out whether the, the gin, the, um, you're actually getting served legit stuff and not the watered down stuff 
is they would grab a little bit of gunpowder, they keep on saying, in this part in the wrist here, but I tend to generally like having my hand attached, so I think that might be a bit of horseshit. <clears throat> but they would grab a small pile of readily available gunpowder, stake it with a bit of gin and apply a match, and if she went <laughs> bang, there was a little bang and everyone jumped back, going, you don't get that so close to me. Um, they knew that they were getting served for legit stuff. Um, because we've got the dry gin as a base, your navies um, are great for cocktails. They blend in with all sorts of wonderful stuff um, and actually have medicinal purposes in, in it because I'm known to medicate my wife's monthly colic. It's a good, strong navy strength gin. Nice big g and in case ever here you are, darling. This will cure the crankies. Keeps me living, I assure you. Now, moving right along. A Geneva is basically the Dutch form of gin. It's what was being drunk on the continent during the religious wars of the 16th century when Protestants and Catholics were doing the Christian thing and trying to extend at each other. That's what you do. <laughs> oh, I, have, I believe in, in glove and tolerance and you know, Jesus Almighty and all that stuff and Jesus Jesus forgiveness, but I'm gonna go out and try to extend that, that other form of Christianity. That's what you do. Apparently things were boring. Um, so the Dutch were making Geneva, um, really the early origins of gin and it's where the Dutch character comes from because the English were, who were on Protestants by this time and helping the Dutch would see the Dutch would knock back um, you know, a large uh, pewter mug of this and then go off and kill Catholics all day and go well that's a bit of Dutch courage you know, the Dutch, are, Dutch are great fighters well they're, they're courageous yeah because they've dropped um, more likely Navy strength um, Geneva and at that point in time, they don't feel any pain and um, the sense of danger doesn't exactly occur to them. So this is the origins of Geneva. Over the years, it's really evolved into its own form of spirit. Um, and I think the best we could describe gin and Geneva as their cousins. Where they say hi to each other all that often um, is up for negotiation and I'm likely to be criticized, but they, I'm a husband, I'm an ex-husband, I'm used to criticism. So, <clears throat> the last thing we'll do today is a slow gin. Now, a slow is a um, plum. It's a particular form of plum, it's obviously European. Um, all those little hedgerows that uh, we've seen in Normandy, um, when the Allies went offshore and there's the, the Bocage country, the good news is, is that um, they are all slow, the hedgerows are made out of slows. Bad news is they've got thorns on them like that, which means if you're a GI or a Canadian that trying to, or even a Kraut trying to get yourself through them, um, the one they put bulldozers, shovels on the front of tanks and just <laughs> straight through it because yeah, that would just rip the skin, flesh right off your bones. But with the um, slow gin, what they do is you get your, your dry gin and they basically get all these nice, wonderful light plums, whack it in, soak it in for a couple of months and then you can, you know, so, um, and it comes out this wonderful red type color. You know, um, I actually don't have any slow gin around. Oh, there is two nanometers on the bottom of that. Um, let me stuff it. No, there's not. There was. Where's not? What not? Um. And slow gins are really great in winter, but here's a bit of a trick between you and I. Um, same, same recipe that makes a, um, a mild slow gin in winter, makes a lethal sangria in summer. So I'm Uncle Hayden, hit that subscribe button, and this is our little exploration of exactly the difference between the different types of gin. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you people around.